Well, hi there, and welcome to week eight of the Emotionally Healthy Woman podcast. I am your co-host, Kathy Bruce, and I cannot believe that we are on our last week of talking with author Jerry Scazzaro about her book, The Emotionally Healthy Woman. These conversations with Jerry over these last uh, eight weeks have been so helpful and applicable to our lives over the last eight weeks. So if you were with us last week, you'll know that we talked about quit faulty thinking. And this week of our podcast, we are finishing with such a great topic, quit living someone else's life. I cannot believe this is our last chapter of this phenomenal book. And I am joined by none other than Jerry Scazzaro herself. So how are you doing, Jerry, today? I'm doing well, and I can't believe it either. I can't believe we're at eight already. But uh, you as a host have made it delightful, and that's probably why it's gone so fast. Yeah, well, it has been a joy to be talking through this book with you. It's just been incredible. And I know, um, you know, I say this every week, like there's just, we don't have enough time to cover every minutia of gold, digging gold treasure that is in this book. But we're going to, we're going to try today as we are covering chapter eight, which is quit living someone else's life. And this is I think it's so fitting to me, Jerry, that this is sort of, that this was, I don't know if like, I actually want to ask you this, was it intentional? Like this chapter, there had to have been some thought that this chapter was the last chapter in terms of the order of these. Cause I think to me, this like is the culmination of so many quits. I think so. I think it is a uh, nice culmination. Yes. Of the quits and was probably intentionally put where it was. Yeah, it's just, there's so much, so much in here to unpack. Well, I want to jump into one of the illustrations that you start this chapter off with, which is um, just such a great illustration for what we're going to talk about today. And so you, you talk about this crazy bus ride that you had from Costa Rica and how um, you were on this bus and like this driver is just, you know, out of control, crazy going around curves and, and just kind of a scary, I mean, even as I read it, like viscerally, I'm like, I can imagine. And I actually had a, uh, an, an incident like that when I was visiting my parents in Florida one time on those airboats in the Everglades. Have you ever been on one of those with the big fan in the back? I don't, you know what? I can't, I, I, it sounds familiar, but I'm not, yeah, I, I'm vaguely yes. remember something like so that. So they're like these speed boats and, and uh, my right. husband's son and I, you know, my son was probably six at the time and we're on this airboat and this guy decides he's going to show us a good time on the airboat flying through the Ever- Everglades. And so he would go straight into a mangrove and, it's, and then like at the last second, like turn. Yeah. And I just was like envisioning that when I read your story about the yeah. bus ride, because right. it's so scary living someone else's life. And you, you talk about this illustration, how, how it's, you know, we can end up surrendering our, our steering wheel, uh, wheel of our life, if you will, over to someone else. And I love how you talk about um, how Jesus himself actually experienced the same kind of pressure to live someone else's life. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about how, how that was for, for Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you really contemplate his life, you read through the gospels again, looking just for how he responded to people across the spectrum you get a sense of how many times he disappointed people or upset people, um, didn't meet their expectations. Um, He didn't disagree. He he disagreed with people quite a bit. And it's like, it's such a different lens to look at scripture through the story, you know, especially the story of his life. And I, I mean, he could never, ever have accomplished his mission or or be who he was created to be in the truest sense of his true self without having um disappointed a lot of people mm. i mean beginning with his family he he wasn't he, you know he didn't grow into the maybe the rabbinic teacher that they thought he would be you know at mm-hmm. least in the uh, the official sense um so he disappointed his family, 
he wasn't always, you know, acting and being ways that they wanted him to be. He certainly disappointed his followers many times. Mm -hmm. uh, he disappointed, um, you know, the official teachers. Um, anyway, he just, he, he did what he, he did what he had to do because he really, you know, lived out of his true self. And, mm -hmm. and as leaders in particular, I, one of the experiences for me over many years was coming to the realization, oh, if I'm really going to be who God created me to be and follow his mission for me, I am going to have to disappoint people a lot. It's just part of leadership is disappointing people. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you're always fulfilling the expectations of others, then I mean, you can really get detoured in terms of your own mission and your own life. And, and we, I'm telling you, disappointment is such a part of discipleship, disappointing people. That's one of my biggest lessons in leadership. <laughs> is that uh, you're constantly disappointing people. <laughs> um, I'm not afraid to disappoint people. Mm, it's not mm. that I don't. If I don't have to, I don't. But I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to and know that it's necessary one, not just to complete my own mission, but also to help them grow up. Right. Right. I was thinking, you know, we just, so we just had Easter and I was preaching a sermon the two weeks ago on Palm Sunday and thinking about even just as Jesus, the promised Messiah, right? Like the, the idea that he was supposed to ride in like Superman and kill all the bad guys. I mean, I literally preached this in my sermon. I was like, the, the, the back, you know, then that's what his followers thought like the Messiah was going to do was just, you know, get rid of Roman oppression and be this fighter. And, you know, he rides in on a donkey, <laughs> you know, he rides in on this animal that represents like peace, like bringing peace. And even just the idea that, you know, that probably was disappointing to some people that he didn't, come in with a fury, you know, absolutely uh, to accomplish his mission, but he came in with, with peace and absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I mean, there's so, so you give this great list of symptoms in this chapter, um, that can help someone discern, you know, if you're living someone else's life and, and I want to just encourage our listeners, we're not going to have time to go through all of them, but please pick up the book and go through these. Like, this was really helpful for me when I first read this list of, of symptoms. So we're going to talk about a few, but just to help you understand, like, am I living someone else's life? Am I living a false self? And so I just thought we could unpack maybe a few of these today mm -hmm. on the podcast. So for instance, um, um, this is a symptom. You care too much about what others think of you. You always put others before yourself and you are more concerned with keeping people happy at the expense of your own happiness. Big things. Yes. <laughs> Did you yes. want to maybe, maybe yeah. talk a little bit, a bit about a few of those? I thought we could unpack those a little. Sure. So um, you mentioned uh, one symptom, you care too much what others think of you. I mean, absolutely, that's a symptom that you're living someone else's life because, uh, first of all, if you're even aware of that, that's fantastic. Okay. Oh, I'm aware that I'm caring too much what others think, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you know, you're stopping and quitting um, trying to please them all the time. But it just means that you're still trying to get your okayness or your sense of self, your value, your worth from someone else. Mm. You know, um, in other words, if they're okay with you, you're okay with you. Right. Just remember your okayness doesn't come from another person. My, you already are okay. You are inherently, uh, in eternally invaluable. You don't have, in other words, you don't have to earn your worth. So you already mm. are. Mm. I don't have to over function, um, in my, you know, thoughts and, and in my actions to get someone else's approval. Mm. Uh, secondly, if you're always putting others before yourself, that's a sure sign too, uh, that you're probably living someone else's life and not your own. And what really helps me with that is to understand that it's the, um, the commandment to love your neighbor and the, as yourself, the operative word there is 
as, put as in big capital letters. <laughs> because we usually interpret love your neighbor as yourself. We usually interpret it as love your neighbor better than yourself. Wow. That's okay. really true, Jerry. <laughs> yes. And that's why sometimes for people that do have a, like me and, you know, and lots of others who had problems with always, always putting others first was I had to say, love yourself as your neighbor. Okay. Mm. Love yourself as well as you love your neighbor. And that's a huge helpful shift for those of us that have somehow bought into the self-sacrifice uh, martyrdom kind of complex that I've got to always put other people for myself to be good, to be spiritual, to be loving, etc. cetera. So, uh, but you can, again, they're always connected. Mm. They're always connected. You can only love another to the extent that you are loving and caring for yourself. So if you're always saying yes, let that be a green light. I mean, excuse me, a, a red, red light. light. <laughs> Flashing red light. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Henry Cloud said, watch your yes and no's. They will determine the course of your life. Can I, can I ask you something just as that relates to Christianity, evangelicalism, church culture? Why is it that we are not looking at the as piece of that verse? What, what, what's driving that? Is it just an, an unhealthy teaching of that? Or is it that it's been modeled for us? Like, it's just, it's just making me wonder why we've, we've sort of twisted that. A yeah, I bit. think it's definitely reinforcing something that stopped, started much earlier in our lives. Mm. I mean, I had a, a mother that, self, that uh, sacrificed herself, you know, for her seven children, but, but, but beyond, I think, um, not always modeling healthy, didn't model a healthy self-care, uh, didn't model healthy limits. Mm. And, and part of that was uh, like, you know, social shame. Oh, I, you know, I got to, I can't say no to this person, that person, that person, because they might not think that I'm a good person. Mm. So I think it has started earlier formation. Because imagine if you grew up thinking um, that, you know, in order to care for others, that has to flow from caring for yourself. I don't think we'd have that much difficulty with that verse mm. as yourself, mm -hmm. but it's very easy to miss it, to misinterpret it, um, given the way we were raised and the way the culture really, you know. Yeah. Well, and I wonder too, if it's, if some of that's coming from the way we view God as well, like yes. that we have to be good right? Like I, I know people who are, who are genuine Christ followers, but still kind of living under the law in a way, like I've got to be this and do that. Otherwise God is not going to value me. Absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned it, it being an evangelical problem, but it way extends beyond evangelicalism. Actually, I think it can go into all the streams of Christianity mm. beyond because I was raised in the Catholic tradition where we were I, we were taught tremendous guilt, you know, <laughs> and again, Catholicism has so many wonderful things to teach us, but un unfortunately I got some kind of a stream there that, yeah, you lived with a lot of guilt. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a human problem, I think, even more than a yeah. faith and problem. then, and then it just culminates in, I think the church context, because we're all, we all, many of us carry this brokenness either from our family of origin or our view of God. And they're right. all crashing up against each other, you know, in the church. Well, this last one, um, you know, you're more concerned with keeping people happy at the expense of your own happiness. Is there, is there an example you, you could give us of perhaps, you know, where, where that, where you kind of realize that's maybe what you were doing? Um, well, first of all, you know, there's some false peace tied into there too, because when you're, you want to keep other people happy, um, that's what keeps you happy. <laughs> mm. Like you're, you're not, you don't, you don't even realize, see, it's so a part of you. We call it appeasing. I'm appeasing others I, because, and there's a lot of reasons we do that. I appease others because I don't 
I'm so afraid of conflict. I don't know how, what to do with conflict. I'm so afraid of rocking the boat it's because I, and I'm, or I'm afraid of your anger towards me. There's a lot of mm. fears that are wrapped up in, I must keep you happy in order for me to be happy, even though I don't realize it's keeping us both in a, in a form of bondage, really. And it's keeping us from growing up. So, um, uh, I've never thought of that that way. I'm really glad you said that that way because I've never thought about how the two things are really tied. Like our, we can tie our happiness to whether or not we're keeping somebody else happy. I've never thought about that that way. Because we do it like the air we breathe. Mm. And it, you know, it's sort of tied into, hey, if you're mad or you're sad, I must be bad. Mm. And- it's not true. I, so I can let someone else have their anger or have their sadness and I don't have to fix it. Mm. Um, I had an experience yesterday with one of my daughters who just had a, a, a disappointment, a, a pretty significant disappointment. And she just said, you know, with, with tears, I'm just really sad today. Mm. I'm just really sad. And so I actually felt something in my body that was like, oh no, this is bad. This is bad. And I want to fix it like right now. And I could be trying to fix it, like saying things like, oh, don't be sad. Oh, you'll get over it. Oh, don't worry. Or what? And that, you know, all the ways I can fix it, but it was only because of my own discomfort with sadness mm. or my own discomfort with that extends to lots of difficult feelings, which I've had to really grow in because if I'm whatever I'm uncomfortable with, I don't want someone else to feel. Mm. So I've had to learn. And, and I, I recognize like it all happened within, I'd say a f- max 30 seconds okay, she's expressing sadness, which is fabulous, which is much (laughs) more than I could do when I was her age. I would just stuff it or I'd hide my tears. And she can actually say, no, I just, I'm really sad today and I have to process this. And I'm going to do some things to, um, you know, that some activities today to move me through this so I don't dwell. I mean, like she already was like, she's processing. I know. (laughs) I'm sitting there like looking at her like, don't fix it. But I've just had to become aware of my own response. And I moved through it too, because one, I was self-aware of what, of my body. I, Oh, something just happened to my body. And I realized it was discomfort at one spectrum, fear at the other, that this is, Oh, sadness. This is bad. It's not bad. She didn't die. I'm not going to die. It's okay for people to be sad. And I was like, okay. Oh, okay. Jerry, I can do this. Like I can ride the wave right now of my discomfort. And I did. Mm. And nobody died. Yeah. So (laughs) thank you for that example. That's a really good example. And I think ties in with one of the things I want to talk about is so you, you outline four amazing practices that have helped kind of guide you and others into this journey of discovering our authentic selves. So this would be the opposite of living somebody else's life is, is really discovering who we, who, who our, our authentic self is. And so as you're talking about that example, I was thinking of the one in particular that I was hoping we could touch on today and it was, it was letting go of others. <laughs> and, and in addition to boundary setting, you mentioned that it is important to not try and run interference or control another person's life. And so it's kind of like what you just said, like you, right. you could have jumped in and offered a word or, you know, whatever. And you're just like, no, let this person experience what they need to experience. And yes. so I wonder, I wondered if you feel like I was thinking about our current context uh, culturally, and I think about social media a lot. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm addicted to social media, but I do check in on there and I do use it as a platform for our church and, mm-hmm. and, and personally to connect with people. But I was thinking about how to me, it seems like even on social media, 
we can't let go of other people. We, we want to, you know, thinking about the social media debates, like with the election last year and just so much ugliness that would come out in the name of debating, but it's, it surfaces this motivation that people want to control how other people think or what they believe or how they feel. And so I just wondered if you could give it like one, I wondered if you thought, if you felt like that was true is that sometimes that is the motivation and where else are we seeing this? I mean, we're probably seeing it everywhere in our culture right now with so many different things, but how did you get to that point? Like you, you just said, I, I was able to let go of her and let her experience what she needed to experience, even though it, it created a kind of a reaction in you, but you were able to let go of that. How, how do you do that? <laughs> well, you know, it sounds like you're talking about um, a spectrum. When we talk about surrendering uh, uh, others, uh, it's never easy, but it is easier in some ways than other, depending on the spectrum of surrendering you're talking about. So for example, certainly parents with children um, or spouses, or even now adult children with their parents, you know, my kids probably have to surrender and let go of me, so to speak, <laughs> which is great. I'm glad the shoe's on the other foot. <laughs> um, I, I, that's a, that the experience I talked about of surrendering her or surrendering. I, I constantly am surrendering my adult children be, um, in order to let them live their lives. They're separate people from me. And that, so, you know, you've got a teenager, I'm sure there's, there's surrendering going on, especially now. And it's going to, and Kathy, I can just say this, it's not going to stop. Okay. It's only going to increase your need. I was afraid you were going to say that. Jerry. <laughs> yeah. But what's beautiful about it is what's the alternative is to live in anxiety. Like, Oh, Absolutely. that's a terrible, you know, and it's beautiful to be able to surrender for two reasons. One, it's less anxiety for you. And um, also it gives them responsibility for the light, their lives as adults when they, and not you, you know, like, mm -hmm. Oh, okay. This is, this is, they're now adults. They can make their own decisions. Um, but you're getting a lot of practice now. This is the practice. You're in, you're in an internship right now of surrendering, <laughs> having a teenager. Um, but you're also talking about this political environment we're involved, which, uh, which is in extremism. Mm. I think extremisms, the extremisms that we're experiencing add uh, a different nuance to surrendering. Mm. And so I've been observing it in myself as I see the uh, differing polit di di different um, political spectrum that my extended family is on. Mm. We've got people in, in my extended family in different political camps, so to speak. And I really struggle sometimes to love, um, to even think nice thoughts about <laughs> people that think are thinking with, in my mind, you know, extremely. So mm -hmm. the way that, I mean, something I feel like that God just shone a light on me very recently was because uh, I've, I've sensed, I have felt a lot of anger about it. And I realized, you know, that's not helpful mm -hmm. and that's demonizing others. Um, when I don't know everything, I don't, I haven't had like, you know, personal, personal conversation with all these folks. And so I think for me, surrendering right now for me is surrendering the anger, but, and, but, but allowing myself to be sad. Okay. So that's different because I mm -hmm. think when I'm angry, I want to distance myself from them mm -hmm. versus sadness allows me to, um, it just closes the gap a bit. So anyway, that's right now. I don't, I, I guess I wouldn't would say I don't really have a, I don't have an answer for that one because, but I would have, I would pay attention to your anger because it sounds like to me, when we talk about, we're having a hard time surrendering those people or surrender because we're so angry mm. and it's coming out in social media, people need to pay attention to their anger. And that's really helpful because usually what's under anger is sadness and fear. And both of those things are under my anger. Right. Like I have fear about what I'm calling extremism. Mm -hmm. And they probably think 
maybe they think I'm extreme. You know, I have extremism, but I think as a, as a believer, I want to, I want to be attentive to and my own sadness and my fears mm. because then it actually goes, it just deflates the thing kind of deflates it. Right. Right. So, well, and I, it's so interesting talking about the anger piece of it, because you, you mentioned in this chapter that, um, you give kind of a great lit, litmus test for this to be able to tell, you know, if, if you're noticing when you have traces of resentment or judgmentalism that crop right. up. Right. And so that, you know, I, I just think for myself, you know, if I think about anger, I mean, often anger will lead to yes. resentment or judgmentalism. Like I can't see the person for the whole being that they are. I just see, you know, maybe that extremism that you're talking about. And again, this is like the politics is just one example of, of so many ways that I think we, like you said, we're not in touch with the real emotion of the sadness that's underneath. And, and, and even what's underneath all of that inability to surrender others is probably lacking a foundation of just respecting differences. Mm. Can people be different from me? Most of us have grown up to think we have had, we had to think and feel like the adults in our life. We, and so we kind of, you know, I've used the word fusion or enmeshed. And so, and most people come into adulthood and live their life. Most people go to the grave, really not understanding and respecting differences that like, actually I'm a separate person, separateness. I'm a separate person from you on a, you know, we, we share a lot of commonality as human beings, uh, but I'm also separate from you and, and we have differences and we can respect the differences. But if you, again, you didn't learn that growing up, you have to learn it somewhere along the line as an adult. And if you don't, it just creates a lot of what you're seeing in social media. The yeah, vitriol, just that the anger. Polar, polarization yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering before we get to our last little piece of, of sort of the application, uh, you give a great application for this chapter, but you, you know, <laughs> the last section of, of the chapter, you aptly titled discovering yourself a life work. <laughs> and, you know, I'm beginning to realize, well, I started realizing this about six years ago when I started really working on myself and, and some of these principles, but as I grow older, I'm continuing to see how this is going to discovering my true self. It's going to be a lifelong process, right? There's so many layers of the onion to continue to unpeel so many masks that we wear. I know that I still am discovering what those are. And I wondered, is there, is there just one piece of encouragement you could give to our listeners who are maybe starting that process of starting to realize, wow, I've gotten, I've been wearing masks. Like I'm not being my true self for, you know, some of the reasons we mentioned earlier, or some of the other reasons that you mentioned in the book, what is it like a piece of, of encouragement that you could give folks that are in that hard process? Wow. That's a big, <laughs> it's like trying to, hmm. um, cause it's hard, Jerry. It's like hard work, right? Like I feel like every time I unpeel another layer of where I've been acting out of a false self or, or not being true to myself. It's like, I go, gosh, you know, I thought I just dealt with this like two years ago or, you know what I mean? Or like, or wow, I didn't realize like this piece was connected. And, and so I just imagine that I'm just imagining for some of our listeners, it might be kind of discouraging to think about, wow, I could be at this the rest of my life. <laughs> uh, well, I, yeah, I, I have, I have not found it discouraging. Um, that's not, I wouldn't say that's like the broad picture for me. There are moments of discouragement, like, like, oh gosh, you know, I thought I've faced that shadow or, <laughs> or I don't like this about myself, but I would say it's, uh, I've been, I would paint it more as an adventure Sometimes it has detours, but I mostly see it as a life giving adventure as, yeah, I am continually, um, you know, I think it is going to be a lifetime journey of, of taking, of, of coming more into my true self, mm. uh, of 
of living out of the true seeds and nature of who I am, which means sometimes, yeah, yeah, removing those other false layers. But I, I, you know, for me, I always think about, well, what's the alternative? Right. The alternative is that you stay stuck rather than I want to keep seeing myself. And I think we're created. I, so to think that you're going to ever stop growing is probably the wrong uh, mindset because God has created us, I believe, to change and grow until we die. Mm. Until we die. Mm. I hope so. I mean, I'm in my 60s. And Pete and I have been on this journey now for, um, you know, like 26 years. And we're still changing. We're still transforming. And uh, so I don't know if that's an encouragement or not. Well, no, I think you, I think the use of the word adventure. And as I was thinking about like the title of, of that last section, you know, is discovering yourself, like the, the process of discovery, you know, can be, I think of like, you know, going, um, I think I've only been like, what is it? Scuba, scuba diving once where you, you kind of go under the, under the water or snorkeling. That's what it was snorkeling. I've done it once or twice, but that idea of like, it can either be really scary, like if you're worried about the sharks, or or it can be this discovery of like this whole other world that's underneath there and and yes. beautiful. And like I think of the colors of the fish, and I'm very visual. So I just like when I think about it that way, I think and the adventure that that is, I think that's a beautiful way to to describe the process. There's one other one other piece, and you bring it up with the snorkeling. Whenever I go someplace into unknown territory. I am so much more comfortable when I'm going with someone who is familiar with the territory. Mm. So whether it's <laughs> hiking, whether it's uh, biking, whether it's kayaking, you know, all the all the outdoor things mm -hmm. that I love, um, surfing. I mean, first time I went, well, surfing. <laughs> recently, well, not so recently, but in the last few years. Oh my goodness, it was so much. You know, better to have a guide, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, and it's the same is true here. This adventure of becoming your yourself, your true self, it does, it does, it. Part of it is quitting all these things that we've talked about. A huge part of it is quitting these things to become your true self. And it certainly is helpful to have a mentor, a guide. Whether in the book, the book itself is a guide. Mm -hmm. A human being can be a guide. It can be a counselor. It can be a pastor. It can be a spiritual director. Um, it can be a podcast. You know, the other people that are have gone ahead of you, we're familiar with the terrain. And, right. it, and we can say, yeah, it feels scary, but you're not going to die. Yeah. You're not going to die. And you're actually going to come out the other side more whole, um, more joyful, more free. And so... Uh, you don't have to do it alone. There is absolutely no you know, reason for people to, to journey into the unknown alone. There are so many resources. Hmm. That's so good. So good. Well, we are out of time, <laughs> unfortunately, wow. but I just, I want to quickly just for our listeners who maybe have missed one of these, these past eight podcasts, I just want to quickly run through, you know, the chapters in the book, the, the different quits. And if you would encourage you to go back, if you missed one of them to, to go back and, and take a listen, uh, we have over these eight weeks journeyed through quit being afraid of what others think quit lying, quit dying to the wrong things, quit denying anger, sadness, and fear, quit blaming, quit over-functioning, quit faulty thinking, and then today's journey about quitting living someone else's life. And, and get a group. Get, get a, a group. Small group <laughs> get a small group or a large group together with the workbook and do it as a group because these are not easy. It is heroic to do these, but they're doable. Absolutely. And, and, and I think much richer when you go through it with someone else as well as how I found scary. it. Less yeah. scary. Less scary. Yeah. You Absolutely. know, because misery likes company. And when you realize you've been living your life doing all these things, you're like, oh, oh, but, and, but all the, the, the community lends itself to courage. Absolutely. Well, Jerry, thank you so much for just sharing 
your wisdom, your, you know, pieces of your life that, you know, we're able to learn from and just the, the, uh, the truths that you uncover in the book and in this, in the uh, workbook. And, and I just, again, want to encourage our listeners, if you haven't gotten the emotionally healthy woman, check it out. You can get it on, you can get it on the emotionally healthy disciple, uh, discipleship website, uh, or even on Amazon, but we encourage you to, to check it out. Jerry, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, time. Kathy. Thank you. Take care.